At the time of Abdurrahman's death, his succession plan wasn't clear. It was obvious that he wanted one of his sons to succeed, but which one? Abdurrahman had three potential successors, Suleiman, Hisham, and Abdullah. Abdullah was young and wasn't a serious enough candidate. The other two, Suleiman and Hisham, were both away from Cordoba when Abdurrahman died. Some sources say that Hisham was his first choice, while others say that he wanted his titles inherited by whichever of his sons returned to Cordoba first. Hisham arrived in Cordoba just six days later, when Abdullah greeted him as Amir and gave him his father's official seal. Suleiman was not prepared to swear allegiance to his younger brother, so he raised an army. Hisham defeated him and exiled him to North Africa. The reason that he didn't kill his brother was because he wanted to preserve the sanctity of royal blood and didn't want to execute his brother like any other common rebel. Hisham ruled for some eight years and had a reputation like that of Umar ibn Abdulaziz, who had previously been an Amid caliph. Hisham was a God-fearing, pious man who was modest, he used to attend almost all funerals in Cordoba and visit the sick. His reputation led to him being a respected figure among religious scholars of the entire Muslim world. One name that's usually mentioned in this regard is Malik ibn Ans, the man who compiled the first organized compilation of hadiths. He also founded one of four schools of Islamic law. The Maliki school was adopted by the Andalusians. One of Malik's pupils was even invited to Cordoba to teach the judges there. Maliki's school was more rigid than most schools and was strict, leaving no room for multiple interpretations or sects. Hisham also sent some campaigns to northern Iberia and southern France, which found moderate success. He passed away on the 17th of April, 796 CE. He understood the potential catastrophe an unclear succession could have led to, so he made sure that his son, al hakam a 26-year-old, was accepted as his heir. However, war of succession still found its way to al hakam al hakam was very much unlike his father. His fondness for wine and women was made clear early on. He had been a ruthless man and so his uncles, who had been living in North Africa, saw an opportunity. Suleiman went around Al-Andalus raising support for him. He managed to raise a few supporters but was defeated and executed by al hakam in 800 CE, the first member of the Umayyad dynasty since the Abbasid revolution to be executed. Abdullah, however, was a bit more successful. He visited Charlemagne with his sons in Aachen to ask for his support but didn't get anything. However, he was able to secure Valencia or Valencia. After two years in revolt, he negotiated a deal with his nephew and was able to not only keep his head but also the region of Valencia. He came to be known as Al Balanci, the Valencian. He also managed to get a monthly income from his nephew. Pretty good if you ask me. Al Hakam tried to instill his authority more and more on the Cordobans. He hired personal private guards who were headed by a Christian mercenary. He overtook more and more of the bureaucracy. His private Mamluk army needed more money to maintain, and so he increased taxes. Increased taxes and alienation from government office, not exactly a recipe for prosperity. The Cordobans revolted in 818 CE across the Guadalquivir River from the suburbs arose with many prominent figures supporting it. As they tried to cross the bridge to enter the city, they were stopped by the loyal forces, led by al hakams cousin, Bayadullah ibn Abdullah al-Balansi. The uprising was immediately destroyed, and al hakam ordered the suburbs burned to the ground. The population moved to Fez in Morocco and had a lasting impact there. The, the uprising made al hakam move into isolation and made him more and more paranoid until his death in 822 CE. During his lifetime, he declared his son, Abdurrahman ibn al hakam to be his heir, which was carried out after his death. He received the Pledge of Allegiance, or Bayah, in a ceremony that looked very much like the Abbasid ceremony, which shows that by this point, the Umayyads were getting more and more confident. When Abdurrahman II came to power in 822 CE, he was 30 years old and he had already been preparing to become Emir for 30 years. The emirate was ready to take on a new shape under the long reign of this able emir. Abdurrahman had been making friends since before he assumed the emirate. He was experienced in political and military affairs. He understood the weaknesses of the emirate and sought to get rid of them. Before him, all the emirs had a sense of instability. They didn't exactly feel comfortable in Al-Andalus. Abdurrahman I, the founder of the emirate, had been an exiled prince. He had no home and had to tame his land, which his kinsmen had failed to tame. Hisham's short reign was mostly spent in an effort to win the throne and then win people's hearts, or at least the religious people's hearts. al hakam well, he wasn't all that popular, so you can guess why he felt uncomfortable. Abdurrahman II became emir without any challengers. His brother al mughira was second in line and had been sworn as such during al hakams final days. Abdurrahman started his reign with no resistance. Now he went on to reform the entire emirate into a proper realm. He disbanded his father's private guards and executed the commander for the massacre they had committed after the suburban uprising. He reorganized the bureaucracy. As Hugh Kennedy writes, 
The administration became more formal and bureaucratic and took on structures it retained until the end of Umayyad rule in early 11th century. At its head was the Hajib, a word which originally meant doorkeeper or chamberlain, a meaning it retained in the Islamic East. In Cordoba, however, the Hajib was effectively the prime minister, holding his own court or majlis at the palace gate where messengers or petitioners would report. Below him were the viziers. In the east, the vizier of the Abbasid Caliphate was the chief administrator and head of the civil servants, who ran the bureaucracy. In Al Andalus, the viziers were much more general purpose officials who might well lead an army or govern a city and the term was sometimes used as an honor honorary title. There was also a degree of overlap and the hajib could be a vizier. Under Abdurrahman, the viziers were given a salary of 300 dinar. The emir also had a personal secretary, Qatib, who was often one of his closest advisors. A divan administrative office was organized to arrange the collection of taxes and the standard Muslim institution of the sikha to mint coins and the taris to provide the official textiles were set up. Abdurrahman II also painted himself to be a pious man. He demolished the wine market in Cordoba and started many mosques. He moved away from his father's oppressive policies and started to integrate the people of Cordoba into the government once again. He realized the power of the religious folk in Cordoba and tried to gain their affection. He was also a patron of science and arts. Most notably, among others, he was patron to Abbas ibn Farnas, the man who made an attempt to fly with glider wings, probably the first case of human flight although there are disputes about his success. Many scholars who previously worked under the patronage of Harun al-Rashid escaped Baghdad when Harun died in 809 CE, and his sons Al-Mamun and Al-Amin plunged the empire into a bloody civil war. Those scholars found refuge in Cordoba under Al-Hakim and Abdurrahman II. One of the most notable events of Abdurrahman's reign was in 844 CE, when Vikings attacked Seville. 80 Viking ships sailed up the Guadalquivir River and attacked the unwalled city of Seville. Abdurrahman mobilized an army under the command of Muhammad ibn Rustam and his favorite eunuch Nasr, who defeated the Vikings and sent them running. A non-insignificant number of them, however, settled in the lower Guadalquivir area. They turned to Islam, reformed their ways, and spent their days selling cheese to the people of Seville. Abdurrahman later had diplomatic relations with the Vikings for trade purposes. Another notable thing that I'd like to mention here were the executions of some 50 Christians. For the most part, the Umayyads had been tolerant to the Christians. They didn't have the same religious freedom as Muslims, but well, still. In 850 CE, some Christians led by the priest Eulogius openly insulted Prophet Muhammad, which was an offense of the highest degree in the Umayyad law. They even went to mosques and civil courts to publicly commit that crime. Eventually, they were arrested. They were given formal and public trials and offered forgiveness if they repented. Eventually, after their refusal, they were executed. By the time Eulogius was executed, he had become the Bishop of Cordoba. The motivation behind this isn't clear, but it was probably some sort of protest against the Arabization of the Iberian Peninsula. Abdurrahman II died in 852 CE after 30 years as emir. The emirate was now firmly established. The emirate had diplomatic relations with the Byzantine Empire and had the entire Maghrib in its orbit. See you next time. Thank you for watching this video. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell icon to be notified when I upload a video. Special thanks to my generous patrons on Patreon who make these videos possible. Their names you can see on the screen right now. If you want to support the channel, head over to Patreon and pledge a dollar or more. You also get some really cool perks, according to me.